Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. Today, we have episode 306 for January 9th, 2023. Got a new show for you this week. We got a lot to catch up on. We haven't done a proper new show in several weeks now with the holidays. I had to kind of go through and pick and choose some articles, but uh, I tell you, we're going to do two of these back to back, actually, because we had two interviews back to back, thanks to the last pass breach. So to get back on schedule, we're going to do a couple new shows in a row. Today will be basically a regular new show, but next week we're going to do another one, and I'll have a few more articles for you next week, but we're also going to it's going to be kind of, a, kind of a combo show. I was going to do my New Year's resolution show, which is usually the first one of the new year. Then the last pass thing came along and kind of screwed all that up. Uh, and then dated privacy week is like the third week of January. And since that week, I'll probably do, be doing an interview. We're just going to kind of combine all these things together into that show next week. So hopefully there won't be a huge rash of security and privacy news between now and then. And I can kind of spend most of the show on some of those other things. So anyway, today I'm going to have an update on the last pass breach for you. There's honestly not a whole lot more to tell you, but I do have a, a few things that I want to update you on. Then I've got a few stories related to uh, Meta or Facebook which also owns WhatsApp and Instagram. Uh, and the first one's going to be kind of a good story about WhatsApp and a feature they've been adding to try to help people in repressive regimes to reach people outside the country. Uh, and then we're going to talk about a couple of different lawsuits. Uh, one is the Cambridge Analytica class action lawsuit that they just settled for almost a billion dollars and another half a billion dollar fine coming out of the EU uh, about targeted advertising. And then we're going to talk about how People wanting to look at online pornography in Louisiana must now register to verify their ID. That's going to be interesting. Also, Twitter data of supposedly over 400 million unique users is up for sale, though I'm not sure that's really that many users. Nevertheless, that's a lot of people. We'll talk about what happened there and what you need to do, if anything. Then we'll talk about an interesting story of uh, some folks at a hacker community in Europe who were looking into facial recognition and biometric scanning in general and <laughs> managed to buy some ex-military equipment that contained iris scans and fingerprints of a lot of people that should never have been there. Then I've got a pretty creepy story about how uh, mom taking her kid to see the Rockets show for Christmas was booted out uh, thanks to facial recognition. And then we've got our listener questions. We're getting back to doing the Dear Carrie questions. I've got one kind of related to the LastPass thing, so I thought that would be a good one to cover today. And then I've got my tip of the week. So lots to talk about. Let's get to it. All right, first up, let's catch you up on the LastPass data breach. Uh, honestly, there's not a whole lot to tell you. I, I was sure that once I had sent out the uh, the podcast and the blog and all that stuff last week, that there's going to be some big new announcement that would, you know, upend all the advice I'd just given. But turns out, not really. So if you have not listened to last week's podcast uh, and or not read the blog article about this, you might want to do that. Actually, if you've already read the blog article, but uh, read it right away, you might want to go back. I've added a few minor tweaks to it and added some more links and some more information to it. And generally speaking, as I find out more things, I will be updating that article. Right now, at this point, I think the next thing we're waiting for is possibly another press release from LastPass with further details, because the one they released on December 22nd was kind of short on details. But for right now, we seem to be kind of in limbo waiting for, for more information. I will read a quick article here from Tech Radar. The, the first LastPass lawsuit has been filed, the first class action lawsuit. Uh, let me read briefly from, uh, from Tech Radar. LastPass has been threatened with legal action following a months long data breach that began in August of 2022 and led to the leak of potentially millions of users' private information. According to the class action complaint, file in Massachusetts court names, usernames, billing addresses, email addresses, telephone numbers, and even the IP addresses used to access the service were all made available to raw wrongdoers. The final straw on the hat could have been the leak of the customer's unencrypted vault data, which includes all manner of information ranging from website usernames and passwords to other secure notes and form data. That's misleading. It was not unencrypted. It was, it was encrypted. So I'm not sure where they're getting at. But anyway, according to the lawsuit, quote, LastPass understood and appreciated the value of this information, yet chose to ignore it by failing to invest in adequate data security measures. 
unquote. The case's plaintiff claims to have have invested $53,000 in Bitcoin since July of 2022, which was later, quote unquote, stolen several months later, leading to police and FBI reports. While the case plaintiff has demanded a jury trial with regards to the leak and their subsequent losses, it remains to be seen what, if any, action should be or shall be taken against LastPass. All right. So it goes on. There's not much more to it than that. I guess what this person is saying is that their vault contained information. Maybe their uh, their digital wallet for their Bitcoin was in there and uh, they're blaming this last pass data breach on that Bitcoin being stolen from his wallet. The article really honestly is, is, <laughs> isn't terribly well written, but this is probably just the first of many class action lawsuits uh, that are going to arise out of this. This was not good. Again, the vaults were mostly encrypted, like the important stuff, the usernames and passwords, the notes associated with the entries, the secure notes, and all that stuff was actually encrypted with your master password. There was a lot of metadata, like the websites associated with those accounts that were not encrypted for some unknown reason. I honestly think that that metadata is going to be the basis of a lawsuit for sure. And whenever these things happen, there's going to be a legal discovery process that will probably bring a lot more internal information to light, but it may take years before we, the, the, the average public, get access to any of that. I have in the last week uh, got a few more data points that I thought were interesting, uh, kind of a timeline of some of the changes that LastPass made for their security over the years. Yeah, when they first came out in 2008, their minimum requirement was an eight-character password, and they only hashed that master password once. You know, and back in 2008, that was probably sufficient. And as computers got better and hackers got more clever and hacking tools became more prevalent, they have over the years increased those limits. Uh, in June of 2012, they increased that one hash up to 500. And shortly thereafter, in February of 2013, uh, they bumped it up to 5,000, which, you know, at the time was pretty good. But, you know, computers keep getting faster and these tools keep getting better. Uh, and so in February of 2018, they bumped that up to over 100,000 hashes. They're a current standard of 100,100. And then they also bumped up the minimum standards for master passwords to be at least 12 characters. Now, the problem that I outlined last week is that it doesn't seem like LastPass forced its users to keep up with those standards. So if you were a long time LastPass user, it's quite possible that the number of PBKDF2 iterations on your master password was still 5,000 because that's what it was a long time ago and they didn't force you to upgrade to the current standard of 100,100, which is not good. And if you are a really old account and you've got a shorter password than the 12 character minimum now required, I don't know that LastPass actually forced you to fix that. And those are both pretty egregious errors. So over the last week, I've heard some other people talking about this, including Steve Gibson, who is the person who originally recommended LastPass uh, on his security podcast. And that's why I chose it and started recommending it and have been using it for many years. He, by the way, has abandoned it at this point. He is giving it up for Bitwarden. But he kind of speculated or maybe just assumed that Things started going downhill with LastPass when they got bought out by LogMeIn. Now, since then, they have been spun back off as, I, I believe, an, a private company again, owned by hedge fund managers or something, some investment group. But it really kind of seems like, you know, maybe since then, they started making some poor engineering decisions and were potentially maybe more profit driven. It's hard to say because when you get bought out, then all the incentives change. And we were all worried about what might happen. And maybe behind the scenes, this is what was going on. And we're just now kind of understanding that. It, this is all pure speculation. So I, I don't know any of this. But the upshot is that I, too, am personally planning to switch to Bitwarden. Uh, now, I don't have to do that right away. Neither do you. Uh, the main thing you need to do, as we talked about last week, is if you are at all worried about the security of your master password, or at least the master password as it was two or three months ago, whenever these uh, vault backups were stolen, uh, you should, first of all, change your master password to something much better. That won't do anything for the data that's already been stolen because that data was stolen and locked with your old password. But it will at least prevent them from getting into your account going forward if they do manage to figure out what your old password was, your old master password. So step one, do that. And then step two, you need to, unfortunately, 
start going through all of your passwords and changing them. Now, you don't have to come up with them, right? You can generate those and you should be generating those with your, with your password manager. That's the whole point. Generate these crazy, strong, unique, random passwords. Uh, so the tedium is going to each of those sites, figuring out where you change your password and changing your password and then having to generate one with your password manager and then storing the new password, which all that should be pretty easy with LastPass. As soon as you change it, it'll ask you if you want to update your vault and you'll say yes. Uh, it's just the tedious process of going into these things. And as I said last week, you, you should focus on the ones that are most important, you know, obviously financial, medical, governmental, uh, those kind of accounts, but also email and social media. Make sure you change those as well. And then you can start worrying about, you know, Etsy and some of these ones that aren't maybe that big of a deal. And then if eventually you want to switch, you can still do that. And switching is actually pretty darn easy. Again, this is all covered in the, the blog post and the topic last week on the podcast. Uh, but you can pretty much just export everything out of LastPass and import everything into Bitwarden or 1Password uh, going forward. Now, one thing I didn't mention last week that I want to tell you is that when you export your passwords, that is a file full of plain text passwords. That is the, the crown jewels. That is everything all in one plain text unencrypted file. So do it quickly, you know, export that file to something, give it a really innocuous name, nothing like my passwords or secrets or anything like that, you know, give it some weird dumb name, but don't make it obvious what that file is. Import it immediately into whatever service you're going to go into and then immediately delete that file. You do not want that file sitting around. You don't want to get that backed up to the cloud somewhere. You want to use it and immediately delete it. But the process, thankfully, is simple. One other thing I have heard uh, anecdotally is that if you've got some really big secure notes or a lot of notes on an entry, I guess maybe Bitwarden uh, has some trouble importing that. And I think it will tell you. But you might want to, if there's any really important information in some secure notes, particularly if those notes are really long, those are dedicated secure notes entries or the notes associated with a password entry or some of the other entries. Basically, every entry in LastPass has a little space for notes. And for some reason, that notes section is really long. You might want to double check and verify that all of that information was properly copied over. But as far as the passwords and the other fields, that should be pretty painless. Now, when you do switch, you can keep your LastPass account for a while. Again, make sure you change your master password, make it something really strong. But eventually, you're probably going to want to purge that vault and then delete your account. And there are links in my blog article on this about how to do that. All right, let's go back to the news. This is from the Washington Post, and it's about WhatsApp and a really good feature they just, uh, they just added. WhatsApp, the popular messaging app owned by Meta or Facebook, has introduced a feature to help users bypass attempts to disrupt access to its services as repressive governments around the world increasingly use Internet controls to clamp down on dissent. The messaging service will allow people to configure the app to access the Internet through proxy servers, which function as intermediates between users and the Internet services and can help disguise traffic and avoid controls. Users will have to research their own proxy servers, many of which are provided free by volunteers and organizations around the world. The company specifically mentioned Iran, which launched a brutal security crackdown and disrupted residents' access to WhatsApp and fellow meta-platform Instagram after anti-government protests broke out in September. WhatsApp, which is also a sister company of Facebook, is not the first service to support internet users living under censorship, but its move is significant because it's the most popular messaging service in many countries. The service says it has more than 2 billion users in 180 countries. WhatsApp referenced a recent United Nations report on internet shutdowns that mentioned disruptions in Myanmar, uh, also known as Burma, and Sudan, where rights violations and poverty have triggered popular unrest. At least 44 governments imposed internet blackouts in the past five years, according to internet service company Surfshark, adding that regimes were increasingly turning to less disruptive censorship measures such as controls on specific websites and services, like WhatsApp and Facebook. Providers of proxy servers and virtual private networks have a history of helping people dodge state-sponsored internet controls. And it notes here that VPNs and proxy servers have some similarities, but the former VPNs also encrypt data. In 2012, when Tehran imposed a partial internet blackout, use of such services increased dramatically. Last year, WhatsApp competitor Signal, which was started by an encryption advocate and emphasizes privacy in its marketing, said it would support volunteers in setting up proxy servers for people in Iran. 
WhatsApp said people accessing its service via proxy service would have the same, quote, high level of privacy and security, unquote, that is provided to other users, including default end-to-end -end encryption. But it has also been criticized by privacy advocates for sharing certain customer information with other meta companies. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's going to lead into my next two news stories. Uh, but basically, again, a lot of these companies uh, claim privacy, but it's always privacy from everybody but us. Because these are advertising companies. Facebook is an advertising company. They want your information. So if they control the app, that is first-party data. And yeah, they will zealously guard that data from other people, or at least they should be, because that's the family jewels. They sell access to your data, but they closely guard your actual data. Uh, now, as we will soon find out, though, they're not doing a very good job of that. So here's an article from The Verge about uh, a major settlement in the Cambridge Analytica class action lawsuit. Facebook's parent company Meta has agreed to pay $725 million to settle a years-long class action lawsuit triggered by the disclosure in 2018 that the company shared user data with a consulting firm, Cambridge Analytica, that was used for political advertising. The settlement does not include an admission of wrongdoing on Meta's part and will still have to be approved by federal judges in the Northern District of California, reports CNBC. The settlement document states that the $725 million fee is the largest ever in a data privacy class action case, as well as the most Facebook has ever paid to resolve a class action lawsuit. The lawsuit was originally prompted by the Cambridge Analytica scandal in which it was revealed that Facebook shared data on some 87 million users collected via a personality quiz app, quote, this is your digital life, unquote, with the consulting firm in question. The scandal gained considerable attention not only because of what it revealed about Facebook's lax approach to user privacy, but because the Cambridge Analytica's involvement with Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. The class action lawsuit was later expanded to cover other instances of Facebook sharing user data with third parties without proper consent. The statement says that Meta has quote-unquote meaningfully changed its data sharing practices since the 2018 scandal and no longer allows third parties access to the same data about users. To the same data about users? So maybe other data? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I wouldn't trust Facebook with any of my data. But anyway, that leads to yet another story about Meta, uh, another big fine for Facebook and Instagram out of uh, the EU. And this is from the Hacker News. The Irish Data Protection Commission, the DPC, has fined Meta platforms 390 million euros, or roughly $414 million, over its handling of user data for serving personalized ads in what could be a major blow to its ad-fueled business model. To that end, the privacy regulator has ordered Meta Ireland to pay two fines, a 210 million euro fine over violations of the EU's GDPR related to Facebook, and a 180 million euro fine for similar violations in Instagram. The latest enforcement comes in the wake of concerns that the social media company used its terms of service to gain users forced consent to allow targeted advertising based on their online activity. The complaints were filed on May 25th, 2018, the date when GDPR came into effect in the region. The DPC ruling means that Meta is no longer allowed to rely on contracts, i.e. accepting terms of service, as a legal basis for processing personal data for behavioral advertising, effectively deeming the company's advertising practices illegal. While Meta has argued that tailoring the ads it offers based on the data it has about users' online behavior is a necessary part of the personalized service it offers, the company has three months to bring its data processing operations into compliance. And this is a quote from Max Schrems, who uh, has been behind a lot of this privacy stuff uh, in, the, in the EU. And he says, quote, instead of having a yes, no option for personalized ads, they just moved the consent clause into the terms and conditions. This is not just unfair, but clearly illegal, unquote. Meta, which has already suffered a decline in ad revenue over the past year, in part due to Apple's privacy changes in iOS last year that require apps to ask for permission before tracking users, said it was, quote-unquote, disappointed by the decision and that it strongly believes its approach respects GDPR. The firm intends to appeal the DPC's finding. So first of all, I'm hoping to line up an interview based around this because, second of all, it really feels to me like we're, we're kind of hitting a turning point. Like we've maybe reached a point where surveillance capitalism is really struggling because first, I mean, note that just because this is Facebook and this particular lawsuit, I mean, Google does all the same things and probably worse, right? So they've got to be gunning for Google next. And if all of a sudden these companies can't 
track people and use behavioral targeted ads in Europe, it's quite likely that that's going to happen with the rest of us too. It really just feels to me like dominoes are finally starting to fall here with lawsuits and scandals and all of these things going on and, you know, whistleblowers giving us more information about what's really going on inside some of these companies and how they're using this data and collecting this data and sharing this data and the algorithms they're using to feed us information based on this data and and targeted ads and all these things. It really feels to me like this is kind of coming to a head, but we'll see. Note, by the way, that I was going to read this and I'll just, I'll just kind of summarize it. I got a letter in the mail from my medical service provider, my the company that underwrites my medical insurance, which has a patient portal where I can go and log in and, you know, make appointments and look for doctors and search for medical stuff. They basically sent me a letter saying, uh, hey, just to let you know, turns out when we partnered somehow with Facebook or actually the it's a multi-layered thing, right? They contracted with some third party company to set up this portal and that third party company did something with Facebook and Facebook as part of this web portal framework platform, whatever that these companies provided, of course, laced these sites with analytics and tracking a, a Facebook pixel. And, you know, they were only supposed to capture anonymous data. And yet it appears that, you know, from this letter I received from them that they may have captured more and, you know, potentially really sensitive information. Now, there was nothing they said I could do about that. They were just warning me that this may have happened and between what time periods it may have happened and how they, once they found out about this, they made sure that this Facebook tracking pixel was removed. But from my perspective, this just validates that I have been blocking all Facebook tracking stuff for years using uBlock Origin. And this is why I did that. All right, moving on. <laughs> this is This is an interesting one. This is from Ars Technica, and it's about... Louisiana passing a law that took effect January 1st of this year, requiring anybody who wants to view online porn in Louisiana to verify that they are 18 years or older and the privacy implications of doing so. Okay, again, from Ars Technica. Pornhub and other major porn sites owned by MindGeek now require Louisiana residents to verify their ages because of the state's new porn law that took effect on January 1st, 2023. Pornhub owner MindGeek operates browsers, browsers, B-R-A-Z-Z-E-R-S, UPorn, and RedTube. All of these MindGeek sites now prompt Louisiana-based users to verify their age. Websites that violate the new state law could be found liable in civil lawsuits. We tested the due process by connecting to a VPN server in Louisiana and then navigating to Pornhub.com homepage, making it appear that the computer was located in Louisiana. Without the VPN connected, going to Pornhub brought up the usual page full of porn videos that can be viewed without any identification or login. But when connected to the VPN server in Louisiana, going to Pornhub.com instead brought up a page titled, quote, please verify your age to access Pornhub, unquote. The Pornhub verification page had a link titled, quote, check my age, unquote. Clicking that prompts the user to create an account with all pass trust which in turn prompts the user to verify their age with LA Wallet, and not Los Angeles in this case, LA being the state abbreviation for Louisiana, a Louisiana government mobile app available on iOS and Android. The LA Wallet app allows you to, quote, obtain a legal digital replica of your Louisiana driver's license on your mobile electronic device, unquote. The new Louisiana porn law says websites and service providers must not retain any identifying information after a user proves their age, and Pornhub has a message telling users their data is safe. And this is a quote from the Pornhub page. It says, quote, we guarantee that Pornhub does not collect any data during this process. This process is carried out by reputable service providers who specialize in verifying the age of online users. Your proof of age does not allow anyone to trace your online activity, unquote. The law's text says that, quote, pornography is creating a public health crisis and having a corroding influence on minors, unquote, and requires porn websites to verify that people seeking access are at least 18 years old. Sites can comply by reviewing users' digital identification cards or by using a commercial age verification system that relies on either government-issued identification or, quote, 
public or private transactional data to verify the age of the person, unquote. The law further specifies that the websites and third parties that perform age, age verification, quote, shall not retain any identifying information of the individual after access has been granted to the material, unquote. The law applies to websites where at least one third of the, quote, total material meets the definition of material harmful to minors as defined by this section, unquote. Material harmful to minors is broadly defined in the law to include anything that's generally considered pornography. Companies that violate the law can be sued by individuals, quote, for damages resulting from a minor's accessing the material, unquote. The law includes language to prevent news organizations and internet service providers from being held liable. Okay, so there's a lot to take in there. Um, first of all, you know, whatever you feel about this material, how do you define pornography? Who's going to define that? Uh, that seems like that could be a loose end. What it sounds like this law basically does is open up these websites to lawsuits from individuals. If they feel that they have a minor child who has accessed this material, this quote unquote pornography, and it has somehow caused them harm. Now, I don't want to hand wave this at all. There is there is some really nasty pornography out there that I I would totally understand a parent not wanting their kid to see because, yeah, I, I think they could have some pretty negative impacts. But what else is going to be considered pornography? I'm not sure. You know, there's a lot of nudity in art and there's a lot of nudity in sites that are for sexual health. Anyway, I'm not going to get too much further into that, but you can hopefully see where this stuff could be tricky to define. Also, this is going to probably have a pretty chilling effect, I would think, on all of these companies, right? I mean, who's who's going to do this? No matter what they tell me, I would not I would not believe that you know giving these third party companies access to my driver's license is somehow not going to be saved or tracked in some way. They'll probably say that they're going to do some analytics on this and do some anonymous tracking and whatever. Uh, you know, we all know that how that ends up. Also, just using a VPN or a proxy service would bypass this. I mean, they used a VPN to make it happen. You could also use a VPN to make it not happen. The UK has tried some laws like this too. Some countries are also trying to use this as an excuse for, you know, not having encryption. While I understand what they're trying to do, the devil is in the details, and oftentimes good intentions have really negative impacts that, that, are, that are not foreseen. So we'll see how that one plays out. All right, so we knew a while back that there was a problem with Twitter data access through some APIs, and it looks like somebody managed to use that and get a lot of data. So this is from Naked Security. This is honestly kind of a long article. I, I tried to snip out the most important parts of it for you, but it touches on several things that I, I think are interesting. So uh, bear with me as we go through this one. Hot on the heels of the LastPass data breach saga, which first came to light in August of 2022, comes news of a Twitter breach, apparently based on a Twitter bug that first made headlines back in the same month. According to a screenshot posted by news site Bleeping Computer, a cyber criminal has advertised, and then it uh, has a quote here, I'm selling data of 400 plus million unique Twitter users that was scraped via a vulnerability. This data is completely private and it includes emails and phone numbers of celebrities, politicians, companies, normal users, and a lot of OG and special usernames. OG in this case, meaning uh, a slang term, original gangsta, meaning just, you know, really old original Twitter users that might have some very short names, some of the more prized Twitter accounts. Unlike the last pass breach, no password related data, lists of website you use or home addresses seem to be at risk at this time. Although the crooks behind the data sell off wrote that the information quote includes emails and phone numbers unquote, it seems likely that that's the only truly private data in the dump given that it seems to have been acquired back in 2021 using a vulnerability that Twitter says it fixed back in January of 2022. That flaw was caused by a Twitter API that, or application programming interface that would allow you to look up an email address or phone number and to get back a reply that not only indicated whether it was in use, but also, if it was, the handle of the account associated with it. The immediately obvious risk of a blunder like this is that a stalker armed with someone's phone number or email address, data points that are often made public on purpose, could potentially link that individual back to a pseudo-anonymous Twitter handler, an outcome that definitely wasn't supposed to be possible. 
Although this loophole was patched in January of 2022, Twitter only announced it publicly in August of 2022, claiming that the initial bug report was a responsible disclosure submitted through its bug bounty system. This means, assuming that the bounty hunters who submitted it were indeed the first to find it, and that they never told anyone else, which by the way are huge assumptions, that it wasn't treated as a zero day, and thus patching it would proactively prevent the vulnerability from being exploited. In mid-2022, however, Twitter found out otherwise. And this is a post from Twitter. It says, in July 2022, Twitter learned through a press report that someone had potentially leveraged this and was offering to sell the information they had compiled. After reviewing a sample of the, avail of the available data for sale, we confirmed that a bad actor had taken advantage of the issue before it was addressed. Well, now it looks as though this bug may have been exploited more broadly than it first appeared. If indeed the current data peddling crooks are telling the truth about having access to more than 400 million scraped Twitter handles. As you can imagine, a vulnerability that lets criminals look up known phone numbers of specific individuals for nefarious purposes, such as harassment or stalking, is likely also to allow attackers to look up unknown phone numbers, perhaps simply by generating extensive but likely lists based on number ranges known to be in use whether those numbers have ever actually been issued or not. You'd probably expect an API such as the one that was allegedly used here to include some sort of rate limiting, for example, aimed at reducing the number of queries allowed from one computer in any given period of time so that responsible use of the API would not be hindered, but excessive and therefore probably abusive use would be curtailed. However, there are two problems with that assumption. Firstly, the API wasn't supposed to reveal the information that it did in the first place. Therefore, it is reasonable to think that rate limiting, if indeed there were any, wouldn't have worked correctly, given the attackers had already found a data access path that wasn't being checked properly anyway. Secondly, attackers with access to a botnet or a zombie network of malware-infected computers could have used thousands, perhaps even millions, of other people's innocent-looking computers spread all over the world to do their dirty work. This would give them the wherewithal to harvest the data in batches, thus sidestepping any rate limiting by making a modest number of requests, each from lots of different computers, instead of having a small number of computers, each making an excessive number of requests. In summary, we don't know how many of those quote-unquote 400 plus million Twitter handles are A, genuinely in use. We can assume that there are plenty of shuttered accounts in the list and perhaps accounts that were never even existed, but were erroneously included in the cybercriminal's unlawful survey. When you're using an unauthorized path into a database, you can never be quite sure how accurate your results are going to be or how reliably you can detect that a lookup failed. Or B, not publicly connected with emails and phone numbers. Some Twitter users, notably those promoting their services or their business, willingly allow other people to connect their email address, phone number, and Twitter handle. Or C, inactive accounts. That doesn't eliminate the risk of connecting up those Twitter handles with emails and phone numbers, but there are likely to be a bunch of accounts in the list that won't be of much or even any value to other cyber criminals for any sort of targeted phishing scam. And finally, D, already compromised via other sources. We regularly see huge lists of, quote, data stolen from X, unquote, up for sale on the dark web, even when service X hasn't had a recent breach or vulnerability because that data has been stolen earlier on from somewhere else. Nevertheless, the Guardian newspaper in the UK reports that a sample of the data already leaked by the crooks as a sort of taster does strongly suggest that at least part of the multi-million record database on sale consists of valid data, hasn't been leaked before, wasn't supposed to be public, and almost certainly was extracted from Twitter. So, our immediate advice is, first, be aware of emails that you might not previously have thought likely to be scams. If you were under the impression that the link between your Twitter handle and your email address was not widely known, and therefore that emails that exactly identified your Twitter name were unlikely to come from untrusted sources, don't do that anymore. Uh, two, if you use your phone number for two-factor authentication on Twitter, be aware that you could be a target of SIM swapping. That's where a crook who already knows your Twitter password gets a new SIM card issued with your number on it, thus getting instant access to your 2FA codes. Consider switching your Twitter account to a 2FA system that doesn't depend on your phone number, such as using an authenticator app instead. And three, consider ditching phone-based 2FA altogether. Breaches like this, even if the true total is well below 400 million users, are a good reminder that even if you have a private phone number that, that you use for 2FA, it's surprisingly common for cyber crooks to be able to connect your phone number to specific online accounts protected by that number. All right, so I think that covers the basis pretty well. 
I've seen other reports that, you know, there's really more like 200 million unique accounts in here, which cuts that in half, but you know, 200 million is still a lot. All this really seems to contain is emails and phone numbers, which may or may not have been public anyway, and then probably part of other breaches as well. Uh, if you did try to have a pseudo anonymous Twitter handle, uh, this may expose that. Obviously, if this really does contain information of famous people, that would be bad for them because they are going to be highly targeted by the bad guys using this information, especially if their email addresses and phone numbers weren't public. But also, we really need to get away from using SMS-based two-factor authentication. Uh, use the TOTP or time-based one-time passwords apps like Authy and Google Authenticator, but don't use Google Authenticator. <laughs> use Authy. Those are much, much better for two-factor authentication. I think originally Twitter required a phone number for 2FA, and then they uh, eventually added the ability to do the pin-based app type 2FA. So if you added 2FA back when they only had phone numbers, you know now might be a good time to go back and switch that and then remove your phone number from your account on Twitter. All right, a couple more articles. This one's from the New York Times, and this is about a military device that was found on eBay and contained the fingerprints and iris scans of thousands of people. A shoe-shaped device designed to capture fingerprints and perform iris scans was listed on eBay for $149.95. A German security researcher, Matthias Marx, successfully offered $68, and when it arrived at his home in Hamburg in August, the rugged, handheld machine contained more than was promised in the listing. The device's memory card held the names, nationalities, photographs, fingerprints, and iris scans of 2,632 people. Most people in the database, which was reviewed by the New York Times, were from Afghanistan and Iraq. Many were known terrorists and wanted individuals, but others appeared to be people who had worked with the U.S. government or simply been stopped at checkpoints. Metadata on the device, called a Secure Electronic Enrollment Kit, or SEEK-2, revealed that it had been last used in the summer of 2012 near Kandahar, Afghanistan. The device, a relic of the vast biometric collection system the Pentagon built in the years after the September 11, 2001 attacks, is a physical reminder that although the United States has moved on from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the tools built to fight them and the information they held live on in ways unintended by their creators. Exactly how the device ended up going from the battlefields in Asia to an online auction site is unclear, but the data, which offers detailed descriptions of the individuals in addition to their photograph and biometric data, could be enough to target people who were previously unknown to have worked with the U.S. military forces should the information fall into the wrong hands. For those reasons, Mr. Marx would not place the information online or share it in an electronic format, but he did allow a Times reporter in Germany to see the data in person alongside him. The biometric data on the Seek 2 was collected at detainment facilities on patrols during screenings of local hires and after the explosion of an improvised bomb. Around the time when the device was last used in Afghanistan, the American war effort there was winding down. Osama bin Laden had been killed in Pakistan a year earlier, his identity reportedly confirmed using facial recognition technology. One of the main concerns of military leaders at that time was a rash of shootings in which Afghan soldiers and police turned their guns on American troops. They hoped that the biometric enrollment program would help identify any possible Taliban agents inside their own bases. Over the past year, Mr. Marx and a small group of researchers at the Chaos Computer Club, a European hacker association, bought six biometric capture devices on eBay, most for less than 200 euros, planning to analyze them to find any vulnerabilities or design flaws. They were motivated by concerns raised last year that the Taliban had seized such devices after the U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. The group of researchers wanted to understand whether the Taliban could have gotten biometric data about people who had assisted the United States from the devices, putting them at risk. Finding so much information sitting unencrypted and easily accessible shocked them. And this is a quote from Mr. Marx, uh, who says, quote, It was disturbing that they didn't even try to protect the data. They didn't care about the risk or they ignored the risk, unquote. They, in this case, referring to the U.S. military. Stuart Baker, a Washington lawyer and former national security official, said that biometric scanning was a valuable tool in war zones, but that the collected data needed to be kept under control. He predicted that the data breach would, quote, make a lot of people who helped the U.S. and are still in Afghanistan really uncomfortable, unquote. And another quote from Mr. Baker, quote, this should not have happened. It is a disaster for the people whose data is exposed. In the worst cases, the consequences could be fatal, unquote. 
according to the Defense Logistics Agency, which handles the disposal of millions of dollars of excess Pentagon materiel each year, devices like the Seek 2 and the Hide, H-I-I-D-E, which I may have clipped that out, whatever that is, some other device, never should have made it to the open market, much less an online auction site like eBay. Instead, all biometric collection gear is supposed to be destroyed on site when no longer needed by military personnel, as are other electronic devices that once held sensitive operational information. How eBay sellers obtained these devices is unclear. The device with the 2632 profiles was sold by Rhino Trade, a surplus equipment company in Texas. The company's treasurer, David Mendez, said that it had bought the Seek 2 at an auction of government equipment and did not realize a decommissioned military device would have sensitive data on it. So I'm not sure what to add to that, except, yeah, if you're going to collect data, you got to protect it and you've got to delete it whenever you're done using it. There appears to have been a comedy of errors in this situation that allowed this machine to go this far and make it to eBay into the hands of, in this case, the Chaos Computer Club, which is a classic hacker organization. If you've never heard of them, look them up on uh, Wikipedia, who knew what to do with this and knew what they found when they found it. So the real question is, is how many of these are still out there that have this data on it and were picked up by somebody whose intentions were not so benevolent? Okay, last up, an interesting story from Ars Technica about how a mother who was taking her daughter to see the Rockettes was kicked out of a show at Radio City Music Hall because of a facial recognition system. When Kelly Conlon joined her daughter's Girl Scout troop for a fun outing to see the Rockettes perform the Christmas Spectacular show at Radio City Music Hall in New York, she had no idea she would end up booted from the show once she entered the building. Security stopped Conlon because she is a New Jersey lawyer. It seems that Madison Square Garden Entertainment has begun using facial recognition technology to identify any visitor to any of its venues, including Radio City Music Hall, who is involved in any law firm that is actively involved in litigation against MSG Entertainment. Conlon has never practiced law in New York, nor personally been involved in litigation against MSG Entertainment. Instead, she is guilty by association. As an associate for Davis, Saperstein, and Solomon which has spent years tangled up in litigation against a restaurant that NBC reported is, quote, now under the umbrella of MSG Entertainment, unquote. According to Conlon, she became aware of this supposed conflict of interest when security guards approached her in the Radio City Music Hall lobby just as she passed through the metal detector. Over the speakers, Conlon heard a warning about a woman in a gray scarf, then security confirmed that the warning was about her, telling her, quote, our recognition picked you up, unquote. Despite Conlon's assuring security that, quote, I'm not an attorney that works on any cases against MSG, unquote, she was escorted out. MSG declined R's request to comment further, but they did say in a statement that the same thing would have happened to any attorney involved in her firm, claiming that her firm has been, quote, notified twice, unquote, of MSG's policy. In a further quote from the statement, this is, quote, MSG instituted a straightforward policy that precludes any attorneys pursuing active litigation against the company from attending events at our venues until that litigation has been resolved. While we understand this policy is disappointing to some, we cannot ignore the fact that litigation creates an inherently adverse environment, unquote. A New York Times report suggests that MSG began using facial recognition technology in 2018 to quote-unquote bolster security. MSG venues post signs to notify visitors that the technology is being used. Ars could not immediately reach Conlon for comment, but she told NBC that she posed no threat at the Rockettes shows, insisting, quote, I was just a mom taking my daughter to see a Christmas show, unquote. She described her experience as embarrassing and mortifying. Instead of attending the festive show with her daughter, Conlon waited outside. NBC reported that others who have been blacklisted have sued MSG over the policy, viewing it as MSG's way of punishing law firms that go after the titan of entertainment. One firm so far has fought and won in court, becoming the only exception to the policy, but MSG is still appealing that decision. So again, another fun and interesting use of facial recognition technology by private firms. Uh, in what many would probably consider public places, though, of course, they're they're not. They're private, meaning that these companies can really do whatever they want since there's really no regulation against doing this. But here's my question. How did they know who she was? How did they get facial scans that were good enough for facial recognition systems to flag from every employee of all of these law firms? Furthermore, what if this person had been misidentified? Would they have at any way, any recourse of saying, no, you've got the wrong person. That is not me. 
Oh, the world we live in today. Okay. Time for the Dear Carrie question of the week, the listener question. Please submit those, by the way. Uh, I will read them on the air. Let's just send it to Dear Carrie at firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. There's a link in the show notes if you want more information, but it should be pretty easy to remember. It's just fdsd.me slash QNA. And there's an article that'll tell you all about it. And everybody who submits a question, whether I read it on air or not, uh, will go into a, a monthly drawing for a free PDF copy of my book. So this is Amy in North Carolina, and she says she's a fan of the book and the podcast, and she asks, do I need to make my current passwords more secure before I enter them into a password manager? I get confused as to how they make my weak password more secure without me changing it. So I will take some heat on that. I may have not explained this well last week, but the short answer is yes, you do need to make your master password more secure uh, if you if it was not already secure. However, your other passwords your account passwords, you honestly, you shouldn't know any of them at this point. If you're using a password manager, you should have your password manager generate them for you to make sure that they are long, strong, and unique, and just crazy random. So let, let's take these one at a time. For your master password, you need to find some way to come up with a password you can remember that looks to the untrained eye to be completely random. I've talked about this many, many times before, but basically, you you know, a, a, a simple technique would be to find a lyric or a poem or, you know, some phrase that you can remember that not everybody would immediately associate with you. It's something you can easily remember and take the first letter, for example, of every word in that phrase, include punctuation, include capitalization, uh, anything that would help add some extra characters to it. Find something that, that's at least, at least 12 characters long when you're, when it's all said and done. But you can also use this kind of concept of password haystacks. And if you search my uh, my website, Firewall Stone Sub Dragons, you'll find an article on this where you can just, at that point, once you've got that, just add on a few extra characters. Even if it's all the same character, just find something else to add at the end just to make it longer. Like literally at that point, any length you add to it basically increases the amount of energy bad guys will have to make to crack that password by a factor of 100. So the other thing that I talked about last week that is understandably confusing is that because password manager service providers know that people are really bad at picking passwords, they actually take some effort on themselves to try to make your password even harder to guess. And they can do this in a couple of ways. First of all, they can use this password based key derivation function. So they take your password, they put it into the special algorithm and out pops a, a, a crazy value. And then they can actually run that algorithm thousands of times. And, and as I've alluded to earlier in the show, at this point, the kind of the accepted number of times is well over 100,000. And this is something that only takes, you know, a few seconds for them to actually do. And what that ends up doing is it just makes it that much harder for the bad guys to use these tools they have to try to guess people's passwords. It's, it's a long story, but that's basically what's going on there. The other thing they can do, uh, something that I don't think LastPass did, but I think one password does is they can add something to your password, a random thing to your password. So you give it your password and then behind the scenes, they add what we call a cryptographic salt. So you can think of it as adding a little flavor to your password. They add a random thing to your password, and then they actually make that kind of your password. You don't have to worry about that. They keep track of the salt, and they uh, they do all this work for you behind the scenes. But now the bad guys not only need to figure out what your password is, they've got to do it plus this other random value, which just makes it that much harder for them to guess your master password. Okay, so I think maybe what you're actually asking in this question is, when you talk about current passwords, plural, uh, if you want to make them more secure before entering them in your password manager, that's not really how it works. So what you really need to be doing is if you've got passwords for online websites that you chose at some point, you pick these passwords, they're probably not good. So you should go change your passwords. And at that point, use your password manager to generate new ones. And then your password manager will automatically save those new passwords when you change your password on that website. And going forward, it'll use the new password. So hopefully that cleared things up for you. I think maybe the confusion was the difference between, you know, how you treat master passwords and how you, you know, how companies can can kind of help you make your passwords harder to crack or guess compared to all your other passwords that should be totally random, then you shouldn't have any idea what they are, to be honest. That's what you have your password manager for. So thank you, Amy. You have been entered into the random monthly drawing, and maybe you'll get a free copy of my book out of all this. Thank you for sending that in. Everybody else, send your questions to Dear Carry, D-E-A-R-C-A-R-E-Y, at firewallstonestubdragons.com, and I'll keep them in my list. And for every new show, or at least most of them, uh, I'll pull one out and answer it on the air. 
All right, now for the tip of the week, and this is going to be a short one. I'm actually going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to read from a Lifehacker article on this, and then I'll talk about it. But you've probably noticed recently that you've seen a lot more pop-ups when you go to web pages saying, hey, make your experience better, sign in with Google. I think they actually say something like, use your Google account to sign in with you know whatever site you're on. And that's these sites have had this for a long time, the sign in with Google, sign in with Facebook, uh, sign in with Apple is actually now a thing too, which is much better. But this is kind of the reverse of what this whole thing started out to be. So what it used to be is you'd go to a website and the website would say, you can either create an account or you can sign in with Google or Facebook. And a lot of people think, oh God, I don't want to create another account. I don't have to remember yet another password. Fine. This is so much more convenient. Now I don't have to remember passwords. And they would, instead of creating a new account, sign in with Google. Well, now Google's going back and saying for all the people who didn't make that choice originally, or maybe didn't have that choice originally when they first did it saying, Hey, you know, you can not use your username and password. Instead, you can switch to signing in with Google. Why don't you do that? Well, of course, the reason Google wants to do this is now they want to track you across all these sites. You should not be doing this. Whenever you have the opportunity to create an account, you should just do that and not sign in with Google and you should not sign in with Facebook. If you do sign in with Apple, that is better. If you really want to go that route, Apple does a much better job with your privacy. They even allow you to create dummy email addresses so that the site you're signing up for doesn't get your real email address. That's kind of nice. But honestly, if you're, if you're going to use a password manager anyway, just create unique accounts for everyone. So in the meantime, how do you stop all these stupid pop-ups? And this is where I'm going to read the article from Lifehacker. You may have noticed an increasing number of websites that now display a sign in with Google pop-up every time you open the page. While it can be helpful if you use your Google account to log into that site, you likely have plenty of sites, if not the majority, you don't use sign in with Google for, rendering these alerts useless. If you don't want to use Google's sign in across all sites, there are a couple easy ways to block these pop-ups across the web. Your Google account has a hidden preference that controls whether you see these sign in with Google pop-ups or not. You can disable these alerts permanently by phishing through your Google account settings. Go to the security settings page and your Google account. You may have to sign in if you're not already. Next, scroll down to the signing into other sites section and click signing in with Google. You can turn off Google account sign in prompts to stop this annoyance for good. Whenever you're logged into this Google account, you won't see those annoying Google signup pop-ups again. You may have to repeat this process once for each Google account. Now, if you don't want to stay logged into your Google account all the time, you can still ensure that these pop-ups don't bother you. For this, we recommend using a good ad blocker, such as uBlock Origin on desktop or OneBlocker on your iPhone. Enabling these extensions should automatically hide Google sign-in prompts everywhere. These ad blockers also ship with an easy-to-use element blocker, which lets you select any element on the page and block it quickly. You can use this tool to hide Google sign-in prompts in case the ad blocker doesn't automatically cancel it out. So basically, <laughs> this is going to be maybe a little counterintuitive. For, for this setting to work, you actually need to be signed into Google somewhere, meaning that you need to have a Google cookie probably sitting somewhere in that browser. You've logged into Google somewhere and you've got an active Google account cookie sitting somewhere so that when you go to these other sites and this little piece of JavaScript says, hey, is this person already logged in or not? Uh, if it is, what's this person's preference on whether or not they want to sign in with Google? Uh, oh, they don't want me to show this pop-up, so I won't show it. If you're not signed in and it can't get that access to that setting, it's still going to pop it up. And depending on how you set your privacy settings and the way you have your cookies blocked, it's quite possible that every new tab you go to will not have access to that Google unless that site is a Google site. And so it's going to think you don't have a cookie, even if you do, even if you are signed in on some other tab and it's still going to prompt you. So what you really want, honestly, when it's all said and done is you need to just block it. I definitely like uBlock Origin. It works on all major browsers, though it's going to be kind of hamstrung on Google Chrome and all the browsers that are derived from Google Chrome, which includes, sadly, most of them, except Firefox and Safari. I'm personally not seeing this much on my phone, and ad blocking is a little trickier on phones, especially iPhones, but that's another reason you might want to block ads there. As far as that easy-to-use element blocker, that is kind of a fun feature of uBlock Origin when you if you've got that installed, you can open the little pop-up menu for the, the plug-in and there's this little like lightning bolt. And with the lightning bolt, you can, on a particular page, you can zap certain JavaScript elements. I usually do that for ads that I can't block normally, like let's say Amazon. Because if you're going to amazon.com, Amazon's going to have these little videos running on the deal of the day that are just annoying. But they're from Amazon. They're not third party. So they're not blocked by default, even with uBlock Origin. But you can try to zap them. And it's it can be tricky. It says it's easy to use, but 
you'll, you'll try it and you'll, you'll see what I mean. But like each of these little video elements is actually made up of a lot of little different panes and it's hard to sometimes pick the right one. And then what I found is at least that when I go back, it just starts up again. Like it, uBlock Origins not remembering that. Maybe that's a setting I need to find. But anyway, I have seen these pop-ups lately and they are annoying. And this is one way you can turn those off. So there you have it. There's your news, your dear Carrie question and your tip of the week. All right, everybody, that's our show. I got a couple of quick, important things for you. I, I forgot to mention this at the top of the show. I really should have, but it's that time of year. It's January. So it's time for my annual listener survey. Please, please, please. I would love to hear from you, especially if you're a longtime listener. If you've got any ideas or any feedback, even if it's just, hey, you're doing great. Keep doing what you're doing. That is very valuable information for me. I really want to know. And once a year, I put out this survey so I can kind of gather that information from you. It's completely anonymous. I don't know who you are. You can tell me whatever you want. Please be honest. You can go to fdsd.me slash survey 2023. There's a link in the show notes, but hopefully that's pretty easy to remember. FDSD.me, that's my personal Earl shortening service that I own, so there's no tracking with that. And the short link is survey2023, all lowercase. I will be doing this for the month of January, but sooner is always better, so you don't forget. I would love to get your feedback. Next week, I'll be doing my annual New Year's resolution show, and we'll probably also, like I said, we'll probably also be talking about data privacy week as well. Uh, so I'll have a few news items next week, but I'm going to try to save a lot of time to give you some of my top tips for things that I think would be good for you to put on your to-do list, your New Year's resolution list for 2023. I've got several great interviews in the works, and the first one of those will be in just a couple of weeks. The fifth edition of the book has been delayed. I was hoping to get that out before Christmas, uh, but the silver lining to the fact that that did not happen is that it allowed me to actually make some changes to the password section where I had a lot of tips on how to set up your password manager. And for many, many years, I had recommended LastPass and all the screenshots and everything was all based on LastPass. And so uh, the book publishing delay allowed me the opportunity to go in and make changes to that. So now it's all going to recommend Bitwarden and all the screenshots and steps involved are now for Bitwarden instead of LastPass. So again, a little silver lining there. I am really, really hoping to have this book available within two or three weeks. Certainly by the end of the month, I'm actually going to be starting my Duke Ollie class uh, here based on the book soon. And I want that book to be available to my students. So that is really the deadline that we're, we're pushing for. But I'm hoping it's even going to be sooner than that. We shall see. It's actually available right now for pre-order on Amazon. Uh, and I think even Barnes & Noble as well. The, the price on Amazon is wrong. That's too high. It's going to be lower. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but it's not going to be that high. But if you pre-order it now, you will get whatever the final price is. They, they, will get, they will honor whatever the final list of price is. And it turns out the release date is going to be closer to that than I had hoped. I think right now they're still saying first week of February, but I'm hoping last week of January at the absolute latest. Cannot wait to get one of my hot little hands. This is going to be a huge update. All right, everybody, let's wrap it up for the week. Thank you again for tuning in. Subscribe if you haven't. I would love to get some great reviews. When the book comes out, I really will be want, needing some new reviews for that because I don't think I can carry forward my existing reviews. So I'll, I'll tell you more about that when the book comes out. But anyway, until then, until next week, stay safe out there and don't get caught with your garbage down. Garbage down.